personality and uh, just a real three-dimensional fleshed out character i feel yes although he should be in jail yeah he should it's like why did he get out of jail after this episode like (laughs) because cork never goes to jail i don't know like he should have been in jail 100 times over by now they should never let him out of jail they caught him selling weapons to terrorists like is that not (laughs) yes he (laughs) i don't know odo's like yeah but it's fun to be frenemies with him who would run his bar, Rom? Rom. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we have the situation where we have colonists that moved two planets that were under dispute, and now that the dispute has been settled and the Federation doesn't own those planets anymore, they're upset and want to stay there. I, I really don't sympathize with these guys. I just say you should move, you know? Like I don't I don't get why you're willing to, you know, die over this stuff. You know, it's not like it's not like you were born and raised there. It's, it's they've only been these planets for I don't know, 15, 20 years max, and people are acting like they're kicking them out of their homeland. You know what I mean? If you came to me and you were like, you have to move or you'll, or, you know, the, you're, you're going to have Cardassian overlords, I'd be like, all right, um, I'll meet you in 15, throw some stuff in a bag, like grab my cats, and I'd be out of there. Like, you're never going to see me voluntarily agreeing to be under the jurisdiction of Cardassian government. Have you seen their trials? I mean, goodness gracious. Yeah, and they don't even have the excuse of the Native Americans saying that the mountains talk to them in, the, in these episodes, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that episode. I, I will say that the Maquis here, you know, I'm not sure what the chicken or the egg, right? What came first? Did they invent the Maquis here so they could use them in Voyager? Or is it a concept they invented here that they picked up on in Voyager? I'm not sure. I'm sure a little behind-the-scenes investigation could could have those answers. But Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It seems to be, like, maybe organic throughout throughout the whole continuity of having this idea of this rebel terrorist group. And it's not that they don't have some point in that the Cardassians are also breaking the treaty. It's not like they're completely without a leg to stand on here. It just seems like the easiest solution would be to move. Yeah, it's like, sorry, just, you know, because to me, and this is how I, like, look at life, it's not the place, it's the people, right? People yeah. make the home, you know, it's not the environment. So, I mean, just if people had these, if the Maquis had that attitude, they if they thought more like me, this wouldn't be, this episode wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> Why couldn't people think more like me? Uh... Anyway. Why don't you agree with me? Everything would be better. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, and, and as per usual, you know, Next Generation introduce a concept, doesn't quite execute as well. Deep Space Nine picks up the ball, you know, scores a touchdown with it, right? And then, you know, Voyager, ugh, ugh, I don't know. I, they really, they, the Maquis thing is such a huge setup for that series, and they drop it so quick. You know, they drop it so quick, and then it makes you think, like, why do we spend all these episodes on Next Generation D Space Nine setting up this, you know, this group of people for them to be such a major component of Star Trek Voyager and then just to whole, drop the whole angle not too far into it. I think it's almost like there are different writers that all have different goals and aren't completely working together on all of those goals. What? But it's all it's all part of Gene Roddenberry's vision, Andy. I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that was one specific thing that you can boil down. Like, there's, I mean, if Gene Roddenberry said it, it is space law. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, anyway, that's just my point. I feel like, you know, a, a series like Deep Space Nine, because of its stationary, you know, no pun intended, <laughs> being on the station, but they had the, the ability to really delve into these issues because they have to deal with the consequences here. Yes, this is a two-part episode, and this particular story about the Maquis is wrapped up, but the Maquis continue on to be a factor for the remainder of D Space Nine's run. You know, the consequences of what happens here trickles down to the rest of the series, and that's great. That's great storytelling, and it really gets you invested, and it, it makes it, it, ma- it gives the stories their own sense of worth when you know that, like, this matters, and this is going to be referenced later on down the road. It's not just a one-off thing. We're moving on to the next planet next week, and that's part of the great strengths of D Space Nine as a series, in my opinion. Yeah, for both TOS and TNG, you have the staple of... At the end of the episode, especially TOS, you'd be on the bridge and it'd be like, ha ha ha, wasn't that a delightful adventure? We just destroyed the civilization, ha ha. And onwards, you know, and yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I agree with you that that's one of the strengths of DS9 is they actually have to follow up on stuff. Oh, and we would be remiss if we didn't, one more thing here, we would be remiss if we didn't mention, this is the episode that has the great uh, Paradise speech from Cisco. He's like, the problem is Earth. 
Earth is a paradise. There's no hunger. There's no greed. The, you know, and people are saints, but it's hard to be a saint when you're in the real world. And these people live out there, just people killing people. You know, and and it, it really that conversation that him and Kira have it really encompasses like the different point of view on the whole Star Trek feature that Deep Space Nine has. You know, people people a lot of people say, oh, Deep Space Nine is too dark. It doesn't fit with you know Gene Roddenberry's vision, as we were just joking about. But you know, it's it's real. It's a real examination of how does this work in the future, in the 24th century, and it's a real honest examination, and without that, I mean, it, it, it adds just weight to Star Trek to be like, you know what, this is not going to be fixed with a wave of magic wand, yeah, society and, you know, humanity might be better, but these problems aren't going to completely disappear, and just because Earth is a paradise doesn't mean everywhere in the universe is a paradise, and let's delve into that. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to get to that paradise, let's just say that. Indeed. All right, well, I think that wraps it up for the Maquis. Zach, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at MoronZach, that's M-O-O-R-E-O-N-Z-A-C-H, and I'm also the host of my own podcast, Always Hold On to Smallville, talking about that young Superman show, and you can find us on Twitter at AlwaysMallville, with one S. And you can find me on Twitter at First Time Trek. You can also catch me as one of the hosts of Women at Warp. That's it for us, but tomorrow Zach will be back with Sue for the TNG episode Firstborn and Bloodlines. Thanks so much for listening. See you guys tomorrow.